and you are live. Okay, are we live? I'm hoping we're live. Hang on just a sec, let me see if we're live. Um, my name is Ian Trevethan. We are at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. I am the Education and Outreach Manager here at the Sternberg. And we are hopefully giving you a live feed. Can you see me? Am I, am I hearable? Can you hear my voice? Uh, we had some technical difficulties this afternoon. Uh, first, we couldn't figure out how to turn our lights on, and then we had some problems with connecting to the internet. So hopefully you can hear us. Uh, we think we fixed the problems, but we're not so sure about our sound. So um, are we looking good so far? We got six viewers in. We got six viewers. Hi, You're six on. viewers. All right, so this must be working. Um, so for those of you just joining me, good afternoon. I can do it with this one. Okay. We are going to talk about one of the more famous fossils in our collection today. We've had a couple of people ask about it, so I am gonna do it. So today we are talking about our fish within a fish fossil. So um, behind me here, just to my, my left, that is left, isn't it? Right. <laughs> Your left, my all right. right. It's, it's all relative you will see our fish within a fish fossil. So what we're looking at is a fossil skeleton of a fish called a Xyphactinus. And inside of it, which makes it the fish within a fish, is a smaller fish called a Gillicus. So um, one of the things I like to do when I'm giving my tours here at the, at the museum is to get people to think about how fossils get to the place where we find them and, and how they end up looking like the way they do and how do you figure out how to interpret what that fossil is telling us. So one of the things I sort of do uh, as a paleontologist, as, as a person who has some training in paleontology is when I look at this fossil I sort of do a paleontology CSI investigation, right? So that would be like a crime scene investigation that a police officer or special detective might do when they find two bodies. Well, this is the ultimate cold case here. I've got two very, very, very old bodies, and I want to know how they got here. So first of all, we have to kind of go back to what was going on when these animals were alive, which was between about 70 and 80 million years ago. So. We have to uh, hop in the Wayback Machine to really kind of imagine what was going on. Obviously, a fish this large is going to be a marine animal, which means it lives in a sea. And in this case, it lives in the Western Interior Seaway that was over Kansas and a good part of the North American basin, which is sort of the middle part of North America, uh, that ran from north to south and, and was there for many millions of years. So during this time, we had all sorts of cool things. We've had big fish, we had sharks, we had cephalopods, which are squid and octopus and uh, uh, ammonites. We had all of the marine reptiles that were running around, plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, all sorts of things. So we know kind of what the environment was like when these things are around. So the other thing is, okay, so how does this work? How do two skeletons end up arranged like this? Why don't we look at the skeleton? And one of the things we, we need to ask is, okay, what are some possibilities here? How can two skeletons end up arranged in the way we see it? Is what we're seeing really what we think it is? So I think the first obvious thing is the big fish ate the small fish, right? That's what most people tell me when I give them this question. How did these two skeletons get here? Um, and I think that's probably a good guess. But are you 100% sure just by viewing our, our fossil mount that has been on our wall in the Sternberg for as long as I can remember? Um, or are there some other possibilities? So sometimes people guess all sorts of things and there's no really bad answer here. Um, aliens. aliens. Not aliens. Um, <laughs> I'm a meme now. Um, so <laughs> I can't remember what I was saying. So 
How do they sometimes, get sometimes people will say, well, what if the small fish was a baby and the big fish was a mom? Well, okay, maybe that's a possibility. Um, sometimes people say, well, what if one fish was already dead and the other one died and just happened to land on top of it? Well, yeah, that does happen in the fossil record too. So we've got several really good possibilities. How do we figure out what really happened? I mean, this thing has been on a wall for a very long time and we can't really observe these guys dying and living and <laughs> all the things that they would have done when they, it was their time. So how do we figure these things out? Well, what we've done is we've come up with three pretty good ideas. We call them hypotheses in science. And what we do with our hypotheses or our ideas is we test them. And when we're testing our hypotheses, we're not nice to them. We try to tear them apart as, as much as we can. In fact, one of, the, one of the paleontologists I worked for as an undergrad always used to tell me, one of the best ways to test an idea is to throw it over to your competitor, your, your greatest competitor, and see if they can tear it apart. You know, somebody who totally disagrees with you. And if that idea still holds some water, it's, it's a pretty strong idea. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to test our hypotheses. And I like the idea of pregnant fish with a baby fish inside of it. There's a couple of problems with that one right off the bat. Number one, most fish, there are a few exceptions, but most fish generally lay eggs, right? And they don't just lay one egg, they lay many eggs. So that's kind of a problem because, well, this is a pretty darn big fish. It's kind of in the wrong region of the body for where uh, a baby would be. Um, and the big dinger here is actually what we're looking at are two different species of fish. So if you're a fish researcher right off the bat, you're gonna know that, wow, these are two very different kinds of fish. So for one kind of fish to suddenly give birth to a new species of fish, well, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, evolution, selection, it doesn't work on that quick or fast of a time scale or slow or, or small of a time scale. That's what I'm trying to say. Words are hard, especially when you've been wandering around in a building all by yourself. All right, so we can kind of let that idea go. It just doesn't quite hold water. So now we're left with these two competing ideas of what if one fish just simply was dead and the other one just happened to die and they just coincidentally happened to land on top of each other. Well, wow, that does happen in the fossil record. We call that fossil succession, which is just a fancy word of saying the order in which fossils were laid down, right? So the other idea, which is also very plausible, is the big fish ate the little fish. So we need to figure some things out. One of the things that we got to figure out is where is each fish in relation to one another? So you have to do a little bit of 3D imagination thinking here. So if, let's say, the smaller fish had died first and the big fish had landed on top of it, the little fish would be outside of the big fish's rib cage. So we have to kind of imagine things three-dimensionally. Now, just from looking at this, and, and Rachel, you can get closer to it if you want. Can you really tell whether the little fish is actually inside the, ba the body cavity of the big fish? A lot of people say, yeah, absolutely. Look, it's in there. I can tell. But I'm a little skeptical because you'll notice that this skeleton, this specimen, is on display in a big chunk of plaster. And if you look at the smaller fish inside there, you're gonna notice that there's a different color plaster there. So I know somebody at some point did something around that little fish. So I'm a little skeptical. I just don't know that, even though this is a really cool presentation of this fossil specimen, if this is really telling me the truth. The way I'd really, really need to know is I wanna know what this fossil looked like when it was still in the ground. There's a little bit of a problem with that though, because when this fossil was taken out of the ground, it was taken out by George F. Sternberg, who in part is who our museum is named after. Um, he dug this fish up or these two fish up in 1952. Now that's the year my mom was born. Uh, so I was not around. I wasn't even a twinkle. 
So that's a problem for me because I cannot observe this fossil being excavated out of the ground in real time. So what I'm going to have to do is figure out how it was dug up. Well, it turns out if I were to go, say, to the Forsyth Library and um, look up some of those photo archives, there's in fact a lot of photographs of this animal being dug up, as well as even some moving film footage that we've actually got on display at the museum. So if we do go over to our, we've actually built a, a life reconstruction of George F. Sternberg, and this is sort of what the scene would look like. Now here you see George cleaning off parts of the fossil. And if you notice, this fossil is actually the other side, <laughs> the opposite side of what's on the wall. So the way, let's go back to the wall. The way this fossil was dug up was the side of the, of the fossil that is facing the wall, that is facing away from us, that was actually what was exposed from the, the sediments first. And what they did is they actually sort of trenched around the, the fish and excavated all around the fish. And then they sort of built a frame and they poured plaster. So now it was encased in one big plaster slab. Well, it was a ginormous plaster slab. I mean, you can see this thing's about, I don't know, 12 or 14 feet long and it's about five feet tall up and down here. Um, so this is a really big piece of plaster, plus all of the, the rock that was still attached to it. It would have been really heavy. So what they did is they actually broke it into uh, two pieces. So if you look really closely on our, on our display here, you can actually see a crack. I don't know if it'll show up, but you can actually see a crack in the middle where they actually cracked the slabs in half. And what they did, uh, you can kind of see it there. What they did, is they flipped the pieces of plaster over and brought it back to the museum and they cleaned off the rock and the dirt on the other side and then they prepared that and cleaned it up very nicely and actually there's some reconstruction going on here because George F. Sternberg was a master of reconstructing missing parts of fossils. Um, and if you look at the texture and the color here, he did all of that by hand. He actually would, would sort of chisel this texture and then give it that unique yellow color. So there was a lot of work that was done for presentation on this fossil before it actually got put on a wall. So if I were to go back and look at those photos and that moving film, and I were to pause that film, that, that movie footage, or look very closely at the highest res photo uh, that I could find from our photo archives at the Forsyth Library at the Fort Hayes State University campus, I would see that actually when it was being excavated, the other, you can see the other side of the, uh, the ribs, they're actually covering the smaller fish, the, the, the gillicus. So gillicus is definitely inside the body cavity of the big fish. But does that totally mean that the big fish ate the little fish? I mean, you know, it's a, it's, it's a possibility, certainly. But how do I prove that beyond a doubt? Because, you know, all through school, all 11 years of school that I went through to to get my credentials to talk about paleontology, I was trained to be skeptical. So I can never stop being skeptical. You know, I wanna be sure that what I'm seeing is actually what I think it is. So does that mean that just because the small fish is inside the body of the big fish that the big fish gobbled it up and ate it? Hmm, that's a tough one. So what are some other possibilities? Maybe the small fish was a scavenger and just happened to find the big fish that had died recently and presented a very easy meal and wouldn't swim away from him. So how do I know that this smaller fish didn't just tunnel up inside there, get stuck and become a fossil with the big fish? We actually see that every once in a while in the fossil record with all kinds of things. So what is the clue here? Well, this is where you can use your own body, your own physiology as a clue. So when we eat our food, if I were to eat a submarine sandwich, gosh, I'm hungry. <laughs> if I were to eat a submarine sandwich, would it just sit in my stomach like a brick? 
for all eternity? Probably not. Something happens. Something called digestion. Hey, Reese, what does digestion mean? Oh, it's when you dissolve your food and break it down so that you can absorb the energy from it. Wow, breaking it down. What causes it to break it down? Breaking on down. Breaking. Breaking on down. Stomach acid. Ooh, <laughs> Stomach acid. 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 Mm -hmm. What does acid do? Dissolves. Dissolves. So there's our clue. So if we look back at the small fish, and we'd have to probably look pretty closely. Um, I would even suggest, yeah, probably using a microscope even. Um, what we'd find is actually the outer layer of bone of this smaller fish, of this gillicus, has been acid etched away by stomach acid. So actually, this animal has been partially digested. So that's how we know for sure that the gillicus was in fact on the menu for the Xyphactinus. So um, we definitely have real evidence um, that supports the idea that the Xyphactinus did in fact eat the gillicus. Uh, now, every once in a while, I'll hear somebody say, well, how did Xyphactinus die? I heard it choked to death. Well, I've got some problems with that because I don't see anything on this skeleton that suggests any cause of death for the Xyphactinus. So that's about as far as I can say. All I can say is the Xyphactinus died with a pretty full stomach. And uh, as far as I can tell, he died happily. Um, you know, if I, if I had a big sub sandwich and then got hit by a bus now, I would have died happily too. Um, so let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, so that's, that's interesting. Um, and there, there's a lot of information that comes from this other than just the food web information we've been talking about. Um, one of the other things I like to think about is you'd have to look really closely, but if you look at the teeth of the gillicus, it's got sharp and pointy teeth that indicate that it was a fish eater too. So what you've got is a fish that ate fish that ate fish. Suddenly here, you've got a food web from an ecosystem that was 80 to 70 million years old. That's pretty cool. The other cool thing is, let's go over here. Now you'll notice that Gillicus is not chewed up. Fish aren't chewing their food. But if you look, and there's a reflection here, so why don't you get closer. So if you look right here, let's see, where's my finger? Do I have a finger here somewhere? Uh, there it is, there's, hi. All right, so, you look at these teeth if he's not chewing what is he doing with those teeth well i'll let i'll let rachel get a little bit closer and if you think about what we use let's say our utensils that we use to eat our food what does a fork do a fork grabs and holds your food and that way you don't have to use your fingers right well our, our fish here doesn't have fingers so he's got long pointy things that help him grab his his food, right? So if anybody has ever actually grabbed a live fish with your bare hands, how does that go? Fish are strong, they're slimy, in some cases they're pokey and pointy. They're hard to hang on to and they do not want you to hold on to them. Well, the same goes for a fish that has been caught in another fish's mouth. And if you've ever fed a goldfish or my dad raises koi, uh, he has a big koi pond in his house back home. Um, and he'll like throw the koi food and then the koi come up and they open their big mouths and go, and you can literally hear them making that noise. We call that suction feeding. They just open their mouths. They create a suction or a vortex and whatever's in front of them gets pulled into their, into their mouth. And that's how Xyphactinus did it. He likely would swim into or towards a group of fish, open his mouth, create a, a suction or a whirlpool and pull whatever was directly in front of him into his mouth. Now, do you think the gillicus was like, hey, I totally want to go into your mouth? Probably not. So the gillicus was probably trying to turn around and get out of there. And that's what those long teeth are for. The, the long pointy teeth is there for grabbing and holding. Because imagine if all you have is your face to grab a large fish that doesn't want to be eaten. You're going to want to have long pointy things to help pull it down into your mouth, into your body cavity, so that you can eat. So that's what those teeth are all about. And that's why the smaller fish in its gut cavity is not chewed up. 
So the other remarkable thing, there are many remarkable things about this fossil. Um, this is actually not the largest specimen of Xiphactinus I have ever seen. I've actually seen much larger specimens, but one of the very, very cool things about this is the Gillicus. So if you go back towards the Gillicus here, this is one of the most complete specimens of Gillicus around. So that's kind of exciting for people who study fossil fish, or I guess what you call paleoichthyology. Um, so this is a very, very good specimen to refer to should you find another partial, maybe fragment or skeleton of a Gillicus, you would have something to compare to. And that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing is the completeness of our Xiphactinus here. This is a fairly complete fossil. And as I mentioned before, George Sternberg was very, very good at reconstructing, reconstructing missing bones uh, from fossils. And during the time that George Sternberg uh, was doing his thing, he, he started in the early 1900s and went all the way through the end of the 60s. I think he passed away in 1969. So during his tenure as a fossil hunter and curator, uh, his focus was really, you know, the, the entire focus for most of, of the paleontology field of the time was to find the greatest, most complete fossils and present them to the public um, in the um, grandest way possible. So this is actually a very historically significant and important fossil because you've got sort of the work of a master fossil finder and preparator. And, and we just don't do it this way today as the focus in museums and professional paleontology is really focused on um, making our specimens researchable and not necessarily taking actual fossil and then replacing the missing fossils and putting them up for display. So this is a very, very different method of doing things than the way we do it now. Um, but that still doesn't mean we can't appreciate the work of, of the Sternbergs. And I think we've had a couple of uh, requests to talk about sort of the Sternberg legacy or history. You know, the Sternberg Museum wasn't always in its current location, and there's actually quite a legacy of the Sternberg family. There has actually been more than one Sternberg that has been important to science. So I think we might cover that maybe next week. So if you're interested in that, definitely look for some of our upcoming live cast because I don't think we're going to stop doing this anytime soon. So one of the other really nice things about this fossil, as I said before, is the completeness of it. So I've got some specimens over here to my left that show you kind of what these things look like when they come out of the field. They're not normally as pretty, and usually they're not incredibly complete. So this gives you an idea. This is really cool because it's got some of the matrix or the, the sediment or rock or limestone or whatever you want to call it kind of still on there. Um, but unless you're a very, very trained eye, you can't make a whole lot out here, can you? This is just a jumble of fish parts. And again, because paleontologists have spent much time, I mean, a lot of time staring at bones of every single vertebrate that, they, that anybody has ever gotten their hands on, a lot of us are able to tell that this is fish bone just by the texture of the bone. Um, and you know, when you're practicing in the field long enough, you do kind of start to notice certain animals have certain textures in their bones and you can kind of, that was one of my questions in my oral comps when I was a, a grad student. I can't remember who it was that asked me, but somebody threw out a bone and said, what did this come from? And I said, a fish. And, uh, <laughs> they said, how do you know? And I said something like, because Dr. Z made me stare at fish bones for six months in a room and wouldn't let me go away until I could explain to him why it was a fishbone. So that wasn't a good answer. Don't do that in your oil comps. Um, so anyway, so this is generally what we see when we see fossils. The other thing that I've got for you here is, I really like this. This is an example of, these are Xiphactinus jaws. So if you look here, these are the teeth. 
and I think uh, I'm actually not good enough to tell you what's the upper jaw and what's the lower jaw here. I think this might be the lower jaw. This jaw. might be the lower jaw. And it looks like this might be another part of the jaw that's been sort of flipped over and sort of cemented or mineralized to itself. So often, again, this is a very good example of what a fossil looks like when it is unearthed in the field. Often it is not articulated or it is semi-articulated, but it is not, when I say articulated, that means it's not put together very well. It's been jumbled around. So you think of, of the amount of time that these things have been in the ground and all of the crazy things that must have happened in that ground in the 70 to 80 million years since this animal died and got buried. So things do get sort of blended around a bit. Um, so there we have it. Do we have any questions yet? We have, uh, Teresa said she saw a Xyphactinus mount very similar to ours in the, America, uh, in the American Museum of Natural History in Manhattan some years ago. And she seems to recall it was also a fish within a fish. Did the AMNH get a copy of this fossil or is she misremembering seeing a different specimen? Well, you know, that, that actually is probably true. And I don't know if it was the A and M A and A M A M American Museum of Natural History that was this particular museum. But the story I've heard is that during George Sternberg's time, the, the time that he was a professional, uh, as I said, it was common practice for professional fossil hunters and curators to in part pay their bills by finding fossils and mounting them and then selling them to big museums back east. And um, George Sternberg's story is that he was hired by what would become Fort Hayes State University here in Hayes, Kansas to start and curate a fossil collection uh, for for the, the college, which eventually became a university over time. So originally the uh, original museum that, that became the Sternberg Memorial Museum was actually located on our campus, uh, but it was a very small building and it didn't take long before it was bursting at the seams with fossils. So what George Sternberg did was he actually got uh, a fairly small stipend um, to be the curator at the university here. And he did um, curate a lot of fossils and, and a lot of those, those specimens are still on display here at the museum. Uh, but he also made a little bit of extra money um, by contracting with some of the bigger museums back east. And initially when he excavated the fish within a fish that we're talking about today, he contacted one of those museums, and I can't remember which one it was. I think it was the Smithsonian, but I'm not was sure. Was it the Smithsonian? Might have been the Carnegie. It was either the Smithsonian or the AMNH. But you know, it wouldn't surprise me if, certainly, at the very least, some of the specimens you saw at the American Museum um, wasn't found by at least one of the Sternberg family, uh, if not our George Sternberg. Um, and it could be that that very Xyphactinus was actually the, you know, a Sternberg discovery. Uh, the Sternbergs are super prolific when it comes to fossils in North American museums, but even you know, globally, there are quite a few Sternberg specimens from Kansas actually that are on display. Um, so um, the story goes that he, he excavated this and when he discovered the Gillicus, and the condition of the Gillicus inside the Xyphactinus, he contacted one of these museums and the museum said, you know what, we've already got a Xyphactinus that's really well articulated, you go ahead and keep it. And he said, well, are you sure? I don't know that you've got something like this. This one has gut contents, something in its stomach. And they replied back and said, you know what, we've already got a Xyphactinus with something in its stomach. You keep that, you keep that there at your little university. So he did and fortunately for us, <laughs> it turns out that this was an incredibly well-preserved specimen of Gillicus. And in, in fact, it's one of the most complete uh, gut contents of any fossil I recall ever seeing. So, I don't know, does that make sense, Teresa? <laughs> Angie says her son is watching and wants to know how old was the fish within the fish when it died, which I would guess would be 
the age of the Gillicus when it was eaten by the Zyphactinus. What? <laughs> when it Somebody died. just did a... How old was the fish when it died? How old was the fish when it died? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. One of the ways we figure out the age of fossils, and I don't know if this works for fish or not, is in some cases we can do paleohistology, which means we take a thin section of bone. Usually it's a limb bone, so this is why I don't know if it works for, for fish, and I am not a paleohistologist. Um, if Dr. Laura Wilson is watching by any chance, maybe she could answer this question better than I could. Uh, but I know we do have, in some cases, ways of figuring out age, but I don't know that that's ever been done with our Zyphactinus. All I can say is, it's not the biggest Zyphactinus I've ever seen, so that would lead me to believe it was not incredibly old, um, age-wise, and we know that it lived between 70 and 80 million years ago. I'm not sure whether the, the vertebra have growth rings that can be yeah, counted. Yeah, I don't know that that works for fish. Usually I, otoliths, which are fish ears, can be used to, to count how old they are because they're annual. But gotcha. They're just calcite. They're, they're not bone. So, so they're not, I don't think they were found Several kinds of animals have what we call otoliths, which is just a fancy word for saying ear rock, <laughs> which actually forms out of calcium or calcite. Cal mm -hmm. Uh, and they form annually or by year in layers. So that is also another way we could try to figure out how old these fish are. But I don't know that there are any otoliths present. I don't think so. so and, and that is way out of my focus when it comes to fossils. So again, that's a very, very good question. And I wish I had a better answer. But in this case, it's going to have to be, I don't know. <laughs> any other questions? That's all we've got for the moment. All right, well, we're gonna probably make this a quick one then, and I'm gonna head, go ahead and sign off. Um, we will be back up tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock Central, 10 a.m. Central, and we'll be back again at 2 p.m. Central. Uh, I think in the morning we decided we're talking about monitors and mosasaurs, so you'll definitely wanna to tune in for that because we'll be pairing a live animal with its distant ancestor and mosasaurs were my focus uh, as a graduate student, so I actually know something about this, so it'll be fun. Uh, and then in the evening, I think, or in the evening, in the afternoon at 2 p.m., we're gonna try to get up and close with some rattlers with Curtis, <laughs> Curtis Schmidt. Uh, Curtis J. Schmidt. Curtis J. Schmidt. I'm, I'm gonna have to come up with some silly nickname for him because he deserves it. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, as always, please like and share our videos. Thank you so much for those of you that tuned in during our live feed. As always, uh, you can share our live feeds after they're live and rewatch them. Uh, make sure plenty of people know that we're doing this. If you're at work or somewhere else not able to view it in, in real time, we love it that you watch it when you get home, when you get a chance. So uh, like, share, pass it on, and we will see you tomorrow.